Hello! Welcome! Hello. <laughs> so, welcome to Microbiology uh, Journal... Uh, welcome to YouTube Microbiology Journal Club, where we nerd out big about all things small. Uh, my name is Danny, and in a previous life, I dropped out from my PhD in microbiology at the University of Chicago, where I was infecting skin I grew with MRSA. Uh, nowadays, I'm a fact checker for pharmaceutical advertisers and the president with Biotech Without Borders, a nonprofit based at NYC dedicated to enable the public with the tools of biotech. My name is Faz, and in a previous life, I got my PhD in microbiology from Imperial College London, where, among other things, I was making flesh eating bacteria glow in the dark. And I've also worked in research integrity, and now I'm an editor for an academic journal. Every week we meet to talk about microbiology, and today is our deep dive week, where we look at each figure in a paper that we chose last week to learn and criticize the scientific findings. Um, this is a journal club, and we encourage our audience to leave us questions and comments. Uh, and if you want to hang around, next week we'll be doing our news week, where we survey a bunch of articles to choose an article for our next deep dive. So make sure to subscribe to satisfy your microbiology curiosities. So you can follow along with any of the papers we discuss either week in our shared Zotero library linked in the doobly-doo below. <clears throat> And we want to hear from you, so please use the comments or tweet at us using the hashtag microTWJC hashtag. <laughs> so this week uh, we chose, well, it might be one of the last COVID-19 deep dives that we do in some time. Um, we chose one called Distinct Systemic and Mucosal Immune Responses to SARS-CoV-2. Yes, because the, the immune response, it, the immune system is big and complex and often, we often when we talk about it, it gets oversimplified because that's, it is one of the most complex organs out there, so it's quite difficult for us to talk about it, just generalizations. So, for instance, in most of the vaccine studies we've looked at, they you look at blood samples for antibodies and cells that react to SARS-CoV-2, and that's for good reason. If you're testing a vaccine and checking for past, or testing, testing for past infection, these systemic blood responses are actually a good proxy for how the immune system is reacting to SARS-CoV-2. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, in fact, going to the first study, we have seen in multiple studies looking at how well neutralizing responses can disrupt SARS-CoV-2 infection. Yeah, I mean, that's like all those phase, like all those phase one studies, phase two studies, right? They were taking blood samples from their patients and looking at blood titers. In this study, they were just looking at natural infection. And you can see there's three types of anti, there's these three types of antibodies that are out there, um, IgG, IgA, IgM. And uh, I guess that's something that we don't often explore, right? Like, I think in all the right. time that we've talked about the immune system, we've talked about IgG, which is that Y-shaped antibody that everybody is familiar with. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, you know, the science going on in the background, like, they know that there's all these different types. So, actually, we know we've collected that data. It's just that we haven't exposed it to you guys, I guess. And uh, it is more of, like, um, uh, a detail in the immune system, right? Like, these different... Uh, subtypes of antibodies they are they can fulfill slightly different purposes inside of the body <clears throat> they're like more yeah. optimal for different types they're also made at different times yep <laughs> and sometimes they're made in different places as well so and also sometimes they have mm -hmm. different structures so iga is quite interesting because it's actually double-sided so you mm -hmm. so you think of that classic y shape like antibody uh the, the igga is actually like got two of those stuck together so it can yep. cross-link uh ba bacteria or viruses or or whatever and have some direct activity to inhibit them um mm -hmm. yeah and, and igm yeah. i think is like a five ring member or something like that yeah <laughs> yes yeah. it's, it's almost like it looks like a snowflake is quite cool yeah. um so yeah we've got lots and, of different and uh, in terms of like what we know about like these antibody levels in infection like from the past right that's why we're showing this slide yeah. that um you know when you when people get infected right we see increases in all those antibody titers um and actually igm it's known that that's one of the first ones made so you get igm first and then it like switches over to igg uh, or iga um and you know these different functions if we move to the next slide uh these different functions of antibodies uh part of the reason why is because there's if you think of the whole body, there's tons of different sites in the body, right? And you need sort of tailored immune responses in those different sites. So the term mucosal immunity talks about the mucosa, these like soft, wet areas, I guess, that are on the yeah. outside, exposed to the outside. <clears throat> areas that produce mucus is how I tend to think of it. So your colon, your like snot nose, they all have to produce like a protective mucus. That's the mucosal oh. immune system. And I kind of think of this almost like a local like community policing sort of area where because it, cause the thing about the mucosal immune system is that it doesn't have to just deal with pathogens, but also with good bacteria as well. So, yeah. 
your yeah. gut has lots of like good, good bacteria and your nose as well has some bacteria in there that coexist with you um i think that's a really good point like it, these sites these mucosal sites um they are there are sites where you would want to prevent bad things from getting in right they're exposed they're they're vulnerable yeah. in some ways right like our non-mucus covered surfaces, the stratum corneum, right, the skin. Yeah. That's like a very durable and uh, relatively thick layer, right, of of cells that's not letting too many things get by. But in places like the colon, right, and the inner inner part of the nose, in the lungs, right, there's an epithelial mm. layer there, mucosal layer there. Um, we want things to pass through, but not everything. Right. And I think this is like the big challenge of the immune system and why it is so complicated is because you have to be able to distinguish at some level. Right. Like good thing versus bad thing versus neutral thing. Um, and IG, the different IG types are definitely like a part of that equation. Um, but also like there are very specific cell interactions. Right. That happen in those different sites. <clears throat> yes. I mean, they, they have to be. You can't react to a bacteria on like a surface of like in your colon the same way as you react to a systemic bacteria, because in a, when it's in your system, that's not where they're supposed to be. That's like mm -hmm. an invasion always. Whereas in mm -hmm. the gut, there's some leeway there. There's some nuance to like whether a bacteria or any kind of protein or allergen in there we should react to. So um, Absolutely. The so there's a lot of like decision making in the mucosa where the immune system has to be kind of very controlled so that it make it doesn't overreact and mm -hmm. so it's yeah actually that's a good that's a good term well will throw i'll throw a piece of jargon out there for our viewers right people call it tolerance right mm -hmm. is one of those things that's very important on the mucosal sites because you don't want to have a full-on inflammatory reaction to every like foreign object that passes you by you want to tolerate right some amount of foreign material but up to a point <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, and so I guess one of the important tools to try and figure out what the immune system is thinking is to measure the cytokines. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so we've talked about immune system so many times. I, we've never got, gotten to show this, like, <laughs> headache of a diagram, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we've talked about how the cells touch each other and they're, you know, telling each other to do this, grow in this way, right, build this thing. Um, and the primary way they're going to do that is through these molecules called cytokines. <clears throat> yeah, we haven't talked about them because we must have been very concerned with like whether the immune system is doing something specific. But we're not looking at how it's making decisions. We're not looking in that sort of level of detail. But now that we are, we are going to be going into the mucosa, all the little details of the immune system that you, you kind of miss when you're looking at vaccine studies. But we're going to get into depth of like not not the like how we can stop SARS-CoV-2, but why is it doing something like this? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, I guess a good disclaimer, just like how, you know, we've talked about all these different cell types before, and maybe we've touched on this concept that there are always new cell types sort of being defined. And like, as people find different definitions, you find different functions. And so like, it's kind of an expanding, right, universe mm -hmm. of, uh, of understanding where these interactions lie. Similarly, all the cytokines are sort of like an expanding universe, right? Because those cytokines act on cells to make responses. But if you find a new cell type and the cytokine acts on it and makes a response that you didn't really think about before, those things are shifting as well. Yeah, with cytokines, they so for, for the cytokines, are small protein molecules that signal and they they attack to, they attach a receptor and based on like the different cytokine situations, cells can behave. In, so I guess imagine like say you're trying to listen in on conversation but you know none of the words what any of them mean or how they react that's basically what we're stuck with trying to figure out what cytokines do because yeah. there's this entire language that we still don't understand because we don't partly because we have a very difficult time of actually picking apart each individual we don't know who the messages are for or what mm -hmm. they're what we can get is like a general idea so like if suddenly like there's a some controversy on twitter you can kind of pick up oh that hashtag must mean something but you don't necessarily know mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's sure. no, based that's... on context. <laughs> it's true, yeah. I mean, that, that's probably my experience of Twitter then, right? Because I don't use it that much. Um, yeah, when I see something, I'm like, what does it really mean? You have to dive into that. And then it could mean different things in different communities, right? I, I love the hashtag like analogy in some ways. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the other thing I'll say, I think we can, we do have some general sense, right? I think some of the first ideas of how to classify these different um, messages, cytokine messages, 
uh, could be inflammatory, pro-inflammatory, right, and anti-inflammatory, right? So the idea that some messages we see, oh, that brings things towards the site. That's like activating a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then there's some cytokines that say, oh, maybe we should tone down what's happening, right? Like not so many things should come here. Don't overreact, right? Like suppress those uh, inflammatory reactions. <clears throat> yeah. So like, for instance, in say, some of these have been used in treatment. So I remember for early AIDS treatments, they used to use interferon to kind of boost the antiviral immune response. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, yeah, I done. think that's probably the cytokine we've talked about the most, right, in all these past sessions is interferon because it is right, an important uh, one that stimulates uh, a whole bunch of genes that we know as being part of the anti uh, the antiviral response. Interferon gamma, I think, is the one we've been talking yeah. about. Yeah, that's the <laughs> the most famous of ones. But we talking, I mean, there's plenty of other like less famous cousins that we might touch upon. You'll probably see them thrown up on the screen, but we won't have time to talk about every single cytokine because mm -hmm. there are quite a lot. And also, like, trying to understand cytokines. I mean, I remember when I was studying immunology, a lot of it was almost like trying to make your way through a Dostoevsky novel where there are 100 different characters and 500 different names. So yes. trying to keep it all in your head can make... So I think we're just going to try and give a general viewpoint of what these cytokines mean. Yeah, giving a sense of, I guess, what we've learned about them in the past. And again, in those sort of broad terms, pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory, maybe chemoattractant, right? That's sort of things that we might be thinking about. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of cytokines out there, and in order to measure them, right, we need sort of an appropriately scaled method to, to measure all of this stuff. Um, and so uh, we've talked about ELISAs before as a way to measure um, mysterious molecules, right, using antibodies. Uh, and that's there's, that, there's a picture of that on the left-hand side, right? You can see like this sort of 96 well plate in each well. We have a different capture antibody. It captures the cytokine in this case that we're looking for, the analyte. And then we use a detection antibody to generate some signal. And we can say, okay, in this sample, we captured this much molecule and it made this much signal. That's how we can back calculate the concentration of that inside of the sample that we applied. <clears throat> But uh, in the in this omics, in, like to try to make that an everything thing, uh, we have these bead-based assays mm. where, uh, if you remember flow cytometry, right? Like we're kind of flowing cells through like a tiny tube, right? You can measure each cell individually with a laser. Um, we can put instead of having wells, the well surface is the bead surface, right? So beads are covered in small antibodies, right? That capture things, and as they flow through, they get shot by a laser. And now we're saying, okay, this is the laser actually gives us the identity of the capture antibody, and then another laser hits the detection antibody and gives us the amount. Yes. And so you can imagine in that circumstance, you can mix all those beads together in a single well, and now that well is not just measuring one analyte, but every analyte in which you have a bead for. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, also, like, uh, next slide, we're going to talk about a little bit about the bacteria that we live within uh, our systems. So, again, mm -hmm. there's tons of different bacteria, and it's quite hard to culture each individual one, so they tr try to hit all the genes and almost do something like a a bacterial 23 and me test to, <laughs> to to figure out the genealogy and figure out what kind of bacteria we're looking at in each section and how they're related yeah absolutely like every bacteria has a ribosome and so we use a component of the ribosome to to track what bacteria is around right because um yeah Right, everyone, all bacteria are ribosome, and because all bacteria are related in some way, then their ribosomes basically have like small little differences. Those differences are enough to be able to distinguish between them. <clears throat> yeah, um, and they in this specific uh, subject, they use this uh, technique called S flow, which uh, they get these like living t cells which express a spike protein, and they they get, they add like the serum or whatever sample would, which has the antibody in it. And if there's spike antibodies, they'll bind to it, and then they'll have another second antibody, they'll fluoresce. So essentially, this is what they're doing here. Is, uh, this is like an ELISA, but using each individual cells as the plate, as Dan. Yeah. Yeah, said. absolutely. I mean, I think that that's like the theme, right? Like, uh, we try to set up, like, right, there's this big complex thing, right? Interaction between all the bacteria and all the different immune things. In order to get at that, these authors are definitely doing. Um, an omics style, right? Like they're going to measure as many things as they can and then try to find correlations between them. 
Um, and to do that, like you've got to make these tools that are easy to do this test over and over again, because they have to do a lot of tests. A lot of data has to be collected. Um, and yeah, I, I think this S flow thing is kind of cool because it's essentially like you don't have to make beads covered in things like cells are covered in things. Let's just make the cells covered in the things that we want. And it becomes a reagent essentially for a, a diagnostic reagent. <clears throat> so in this study, they had like 49 COVID-19 patients and like 12 healthy controls. And they mm -hmm. and they classified their disease a bit on being moderate, severe, and critical based on say whether whether so they took X-rays of them, they're monitoring them and treating them, so they know that they whether they had like lung involvement, the level of like danger that they were in essentially, um, and their symptoms. So they uh, so these are all kind of fairly severe patients, and from them they took blood samples and nasal swabs, mm -hmm. and so a lot so from whenever we see any data from this, it's usually from either a blood sample or a nasal swab. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll try to tell you which one it is because, yeah, they're looking at both. <clears throat> yes. Um, so, for... Okay, so just for our first figure, um, which is really just a recap of the fact that they use this S-flow technique. They just want to show us that there's a correlation between the amount of uh, anti-spike uh, IgA and IgG measured by both the S-flow method and the ELISA method. <laughs> yeah, this is basically a, a race to see which one's... How they compare to each other, and it's interesting because, uh, you, yeah, because the first, because basically from this you can see there's a very steep early part of the curve, and then it flattens out. So, this mm -hmm. essentially will tell you that the most variation you can see from the S flow technique happens at very low concentrations. So it's, mm -hmm. it seems to be much more sensitive and have mm -hmm. that the period of like high, a good resolution when you get to that level of sensitivity. And once you get above a certain level. Uh, the ELISAs tend to be better because they don't get saturated as easily. So you can measure more, you can measure like higher levels of antibody, but you can be more sensitive with it. So I think that's why they use both method methods in this. Yeah, I, I think that's, yeah, I think that that's part of it. Um, I think part of it too might be that uh, like they have so little sample to work with. It, it must, mm. right, like part of the reason they even explored, right, like the flow method would probably because maybe you can batch it easier and then also they have a limited amount of sample. So they want to, yeah. in an ELISA, you have to like fill up the whole well with yeah. stuff. Here they probably can just mix like a few microliters of cells with a few microliters of their analyte. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. Uh, and the next figure, they you've got this big honking heat, heat map in there mm -hmm. where... The, the black squares are just for the healthy healthy controls. Green are the patients with SARS-CoV-2. The red are the ones with the really severe ones. So And the purple is in the middle, and then blue yep. is kind of the the less severe cases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and they're doing their uh, ELISA and their flow assay, and they're showing us, like, with the... In the heat map, like, the orange, right, means that they're getting a lot more signal, and the blue means that they're not getting a lot. So you can see that there's not a lot of signal in the healthy controls. That's what we expect. Mm -hmm. um, although uh, not, right, like, if you remember, like, there are some level of antibodies, right, that, that circulate that are reactive to the spike protein. Mm -hmm. um, right, and so you can see it's not perfect, right? They're not all at negative one. Some of them do show a little bit of binding, right? We remember from last time. Right. Uh, and yeah, and then as you increase in severity, in general, that's what they're seeing, an increase in the amount of antibody. Yeah, which is what you'd expect. When you're in a severe disease, your immune system is like really going on all, pumping all cylinders and, and pumping out antibodies. So yeah, it, it makes sense. They measure like antibodies by several different methods. So I am fully certain that they're seeing lots of antibodies. <laughs> yeah, like that's all BMCR, right? It's really the same information. Actually, even it's the... For, they're the same, uh, for the two different things, they're the same assay as well, right? Like, yeah. they even change up the assay, right? Two assays with two different ways of measuring that assay gives us four graphs at the bottom. <laughs> yeah, so we're, they're trying every sort of technique. I guess, imagine, so I'm imagining myself as a researcher in the future trying to refer to this, and I'm using multiple techniques, so I've got lots of stuff to compare, maybe? So I guess that might be useful for people in the future. Right now, it's like, okay, that's a lot to deal with at the moment, but it might be... Might be useful yeah. for other researchers. Yeah. I, I mean, again, if they made their data, underlying data... Oh, I see. No, but yeah, each one is a collection method on that. So, yeah, it is it is useful. <laughs> uh, yeah, and 1DEF. Okay. 
So. so this is looking at neutralizing antibody levels, right? So just because it recognizes the spike doesn't mean that it would necessarily uh, neutralize, right? We've talked about this before. Neutralization is a very functional assay. So they use pseudotype virus, I believe, in their neutralizing assay. So it's not yep. real SARS-CoV-2, but it is a viral membrane that has SARS-CoV-2 on it and or the spike protein on it. And if the spike protein recognizes a receptor, it is able to fuse. Uh, and we can see that the antibodies from serum in these patients uh, do prohibit that fusion. <clears throat> yeah. And again, we see that trend of like the moderate, cr severe and critical. So the red is critical. So that's got the highest as you'd expect. And so, yeah, this is basically setting up the background of yeah. what we'd expect. Yeah. Uh, okay, and uh, in S1B, they uh, dive deeper into these isotypes uh, just to say, oh, like we saw this difference in neutralizing ability. Uh, let's just make sure that it doesn't correlate right, with differences in the amounts of these different antibodies. Um, this is also a way to even understand the antibody response, yeah. like maybe it's skewed right, in, in the disease states, um, but that's not what they see. Everything looks the yeah. same. Yeah. EG IgM, IgA, and then all these isotypes of IgG. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, this is... I can sense almost a disappointment here because they're hoping to see something that'd be interesting. Like, But now, since everything's flat... And, of course, it'd be the first thing I'd say as a real. be like, oh, do you look at the IgG subtypes? And they'd be like, okay. This, so they're, getting, they're covering all their bases with this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and as we said at the beginning, they're going to look at nasal samples as well. Yes. So in the next bank of... Uh, of slides uh, or figures, uh, it's the same sort of stuff, right? They're looking at flow and ELISA, but now they're using these nasal turbinate swabs. <laughs> so yeah. like kind of uh, they swab it and they take the liquid that comes from the swab. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, which, uh, yeah, it, it goes really far, right, right up into the nose. It's really uncomfortable. So I can imagine it's quite difficult to get more than one sample from patients without them being really upset. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then right, this is, I think, highlights that idea that they've had, they have so little material to work with, <laughs> right? Because it's like what they can absorb, right, from that sort of, um, that sampling technique, right? I mean, people, I, I'm sure many of our viewers now probably have experienced this if they've gotten tested for COVID-19. Uh, it's essentially the same thing, maybe with a more absorbent, I'm guessing a more absorbent um, uh, swab so that they can yeah. get more, uh, liquid out. <laughs> Yeah, and of course, like with a blood sample and comparing blood samples with swabs is, is very difficult because swabs they put they pick up so little compared to a blood sample. Blood sample you get like a mill or quite quite a bit a lot of cells, whereas with <laughs> with nasal swabs you get very little. And so from that you'd kind of expect that they'd almost have a, a slightly more variation than swab than than in plasma because uh, sure. <clears throat> smaller sample size means smaller like amounts of whatever's in there. So there's going to be more variance because. Each of yeah. that is representative of, of much more. Um, yeah. But actually, I would say that the variants, I mean, they don't directly compare variants between these two types, but they look the same to me. Like, the spread of the dots looks really similar. Are the scales the same? Uh, well, I mean, some of the scales are percentages, so it's it's quite difficult to make that comparison. But, mm -hmm. it, I mean, it's something that I would, I mean, I'd expect there to be slightly more variants, but it might not be, it might be kind of different. It's, right. I mean, right. I mean, I'm I mean, no, I think yeah. it's important always to know the limitate, right? Like some expected limitations, right, of the sampling technique you're using, and that's something that they have to think about too when we have yeah. to think when interpreting the data. <clears throat> uh, so yeah, it's pretty much the same thing. You see that there is a distinct difference, although it is like in the IgG levels, and of course it increases yeah. the severity. Um, mm -hmm. Moving yeah. on to yeah. big next one, which is looking at. Um, anti-spike IgG and IgA levels. Um, yeah. This is the correlation between the ELISA and the... Wait, this is one S1CD, right? S1CD, yes. Yeah, the correlation between the spike by ELISA and the spike by flow, right? We've seen that before. It's the same, right? There's that... Um, I mean, I guess some of the later uh, points seem kind of off. Maybe that's the variance. <laughs> Um, and then again, they're looking at uh, whether the levels are different. Here, they actually do see something different than in yes. serum. Yeah, um, it looks like there's more IgA being produced in the critical samples than in healthy controls or moderately uh, infected. Which uh, makes sense because uh, I mean, IgA is one of the things that's much bigger in the secretory like immune system. So when the muco when the mucus secretes cells, 
generally they secrete lots of IgA because that's almost directly mm-hmm. attacks whatever like pathogen is there. there. So yep. it's not like in the serum where it can set off lots of different cytokines and rely on other immune cells to to come up. Uh, I feel like yeah. I, so I, actually this could be the first sort of hint uh, in terms of like how they will end up interpreting all the data in this paper, right? But this is the first hint that we're getting, and it's something that we already know, right? That like IgA is a very important uh, immunoglobulin in the mucosa, <laughs> and so if there's some sort of immune response happening, we're going to see an elevated amount of IgA <laughs> in the right. mucosa. And uh, it does seem to be the case in the critical patients that something is happening there. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, so yeah. Um, next one is Fig two two A, mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. they they look at like patients with uh, yeah with the different levels of infection, and they look at the levels of they compare like s- serum and uh, yeah the yeah on the left it's the serum and on the right it's the nasal samples. <laughs> yeah, they call it nasal conversion, which is an interesting. So was, what they basically see is they're seeing less in in the serum compared it's less in the sorry less in the mucosal surfaces than in the serum yeah yeah and i think they choose a break point i think to do this right like they have some sort of break point like if you have more uh antibody right like in in your sample than this break point they consider you converted right and then they right. go through all their samples and they say oh look like it seems like uh you you have a higher rate of conversion seroconversion in the serum than you do in the nasopharynx right so not everybody right is going to have some response right in their nasopharynx is is what they're uh suggesting here <clears throat> right and they sentence it's weird because it seems like the moderate disease the less severe disease has less effect in its nasopharynx mm-hmm. which is Almost mm. counterintuitive, I guess, because you'd expect that they'd be handling handling the the infection better. But I, I mean, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, they have this eight to twelve days. Like, I think the window is probably something, right? Yeah. That amping that out because I'm not sure how quickly, right? You have to have that IgA response. Maybe they all had like a initial spike in some ways, and then it went down. Yeah, it's hard to say. Yes, <laughs> uh, that's something I'd emphasize. That what we're seeing here is a snapshot rather than. Like the whole infection. This is just one point in time. So, um, sorry, I'm about to lose my my notes uh, on my second screen. Hold on a second. Um, oh, okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry, like my I've got my notes on, my, on a TV screen and it shuts down randomly, so I need to. Make... But anyway, uh, yeah, yeah. No, I've... Uh, the next figure we have is figure two B and S two A. Uh, so in this one, we're going to look for they're going to go they're going to look for some correlations to try to start making I guess rough conclusion statements on the data that they've already seen. Um, yeah. And I guess it's important to emphasize here, right, that these are correlations. So like we don't really know like what caused what, <laughs> um, just that they are happening together, right? And the idea right. is that because it's not happening in the healthy controls, that it's something about the infection. Yeah, uh, there is a definite difference in the in the like serum in the plasma. You can see there is almost a difference in the critical level infection compared with the moderates and the lower ones. Mhm, mhm. Yeah, you can see a little bit of a spread. They all have a weak positive correlate, at least a weak positive correlation. Mm. Here. So that's comparing um, IgG levels and IgA levels, right, in the plasma and the nasopharynx. So this idea that if you responded. I mean, this is, it's supposed to suggest, right, like, if you've responded in the serum, then you're likely to have responded. It's, yeah, it's more likely to have responded than in the uh, nasopharynx. <clears throat> right. Uh, so next we're looking at Fig 2C and S2B, which, mm-hmm. um, again, this is a, another correlation. So we're getting quite a lot of these. Um, and they did, yeah, there's quite a lot of variation in all these samples. But uh, they do kind of, like, look, find that they... The lack of correlation, they, they kind of cite as evidence that mucosal immunity is being regulated slightly different from the plasma immunity. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I mean... Yeah so, yeah, so this time, instead of comparing IgA with IgG, they're comparing plasma with nasopharynx on yes. the, same, the same correlation plot. Yeah, so, I, I'm sorry, I guess I might have misspoke at the last one. It's not... It's not I, sometimes in my head, I make IgG the surrogate of... Uh, systemic and IgA the surrogate of 
mucosal, but that's not the case, actually, no. right? Like, have iga in your blood as well <laughs> yeah you, you get bit, bits of both but some basics there's slightly different little com things you get in the secret secretory versus the uh, serum um yeah. the proportions are a little bit different or something like this so if you want to know the difference between the plaza the, yeah the plaza the systemic compartment and the mucosal compartment better to put them all on the same uh correlatory graph uh and then they don't they say that they don't see it here so yeah again um, it's like yeah. It's like not the well. most uh, persuasive like thing to say that they're separate, but it certainly is like suggests suggests that these compartments yeah. are different. Yeah. I mean, it, like based on like background in, information, I say that oh yeah, I agree with that. But that's because of my own biases coming into that. I've read other papers that have been gone into this question in more detail and said okay, yeah, yeah. there is a different distinct mucosal immunity. So... Yeah, I think that that's where like I'll I'll bring it up here now because I think it, it's just like a nice maybe I it's been on my mind like talking about this paper a lot and thinking about it is that I find that a lot of the things that they are showing in this paper are things that maybe I know from a general like idea from other studies right that we know mm -hmm. how the immune system reacts right we know that these compartments are different right like and and we sort of set up the logic at the very beginning that they do respond they should respond differently as well right to to perturbation of uh, to an infection so yeah. Uh, yeah there's a lot of stuff here that uh might not be super groundbreaking, but I guess because it's in the context of SARS-CoV-2, right? Like it's something we're learning the specific response, right? In, in, for the specific thing. And it, it matches what we think of in other infections, right? We're sort of looking for the deviation in this data. Yeah. Um... And also we're relying on the authors to point us to that because like we're not super comfortable saying like, oh yeah, I, this looks like a deviation to me from what I would expect. But, but we'll see how that goes as we continue. <laughs> Uh, yeah, def definitely. I mean, they're not work. They're, they've got very little to work with, and they're trying to do as much as they can with it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, in Figure S two C and D, uh, now we're looking at okay the levels of IgA in the nasopharynx, but the IgG in the plasma, <laughs> right? And then also right. splitting that, right? The IgG in the nasopharynx and the IgA in the plasma, right? And you can uh, do the the converse uh, switches, the <laughs> reciprocal switches of the, that comparison. And here they um, they do see, oh, they, yeah, they don't, again, they're not really seeing any correlation here. So again, yeah. reinforcing the idea that these are distinct, uh, distinct responses, right? Like uh, the patients that respond um, in the nasopharynx aren't necessarily the patients that respond in the plasma. Strong. Yeah, and uh, a lot of all these uh, correlations, I'm seeing lots of like almost saturation at the top, where you we get a lot of, uh, uh, dots clustering at, at the top level, which seem to speak to like some kind of uh, saturation effect in the assay, where there's that there, there could be more variation there, but it's getting cut off potentially. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, for sure and i think um so yeah so that might be inhibiting our way to think about this right like uh, it makes it more all or nothing than it would be otherwise um specifically i guess in what is it it's a it's the nasopharynx assay that seems right. like it right it's the nasopharynx assay is really pressing the stuff up to the top <laughs> yeah that's yeah yeah that's mm -hmm. very interesting though um yeah, okay. and it's like uh, maybe if they had diluted their nasopharynx assay, right? I mean, so that would have helped. I'm because I'm not really sure because I think like maybe this, I mean, it's the way the successful for assay. I'm not sure like dilution is the way because it, it, since it counts cells in individually, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I I, I don't I'm not sure how to interpret that. I mean, because yeah. essentially that's right. like the number of cells that, that turn up positive, so they'd probably need to have more of their two nine three cells in there in order to get a spread and and have that dilution effect come into play um, uh, yeah so but... yeah maybe it's uh, maybe it's actually the measurement right because this is percent of cells but earlier they used mfi the mean yeah. fluorescence intensity so like actually it would be maybe more in i would just be interested to see the mfi plotted against right of these yeah. things because that gives us maybe that might give us more dynamic range. <clears throat> yeah, because yeah. like at the, at the moment you get because the assumption based on this is that one antibody per cell, but that might not be the case. You've got a saturated sample. You might have mm -hmm. multiple antibodies, in which case the MFI could tell you a lot because you see actually how much more they're glowing based on the antibodies. And yeah. so you have a certain amount of cells, and suddenly you see oh they're glowing much more. So that's why I think like the ELISA's kind of would be 
useful like that, perhaps, because then yeah. you can get those higher levels. Or even just if you take the MFI from these readings. Um, and that's what we see, right? Because they have the on the on the right hand side, then they have the Elizas. Yes, right, that's that they, right. And we do see that it's not you don't get that weird saturation effect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, so with the Elizas, what you what you see if if it's a very low, then you see something happening at the bottom, and so yeah, looking at these, it's almost like trying to find the Goldilocks zone as a, the right way to look at the data. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so like. So on uh, the left-hand side, it's all very sensitive, and above a certain level, then you can look at the right-hand side and go, okay, wow. Yeah, and uh, and then yeah, the other thing, I guess, the other thing to see is just like yeah, there's there's definitely a bunch of things that um, like that just stick to the axes, right? Yeah, and I think that that that's helping to drive their correlation as well, right? Because like or their lack of correlation, right? Because like because things stick onto these axes, right? Like it means that when the algorithm that's trying to draw the Spearman right line is looking at it, it's like it's confused, right? It can't I mean, draw like a line because of stuff is stuck at the axes. Well, it really depends because I think like sometimes algorithms can pick up differences that we can't, uh, but it's making us it's definitely making things much more difficult for us to notice. Because, mm -hmm. uh, again, like if it was a logarithmic scale, you'd you'd see some, you get gain some more information and you lose some more information. Usually, algorithms can take that out, out take account of that. So, yeah. I mean, when they come, because when they come out and say, okay, maybe this, the the machine we put this through said that there's nothing to see here, then I'm I'm willing to believe the machine in this case. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some instances where you can confuse the statistic machine that is trying to pick up what the differences are in the data, but I'm not sure that's happening here. Oh yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Not to say that the machine is confused, but I'm just saying that like that's driving the fact that there is no correlation, right? Yeah. It is making those points, and it's like the phrasing no correlation, right? It says that there are cases in which, right, you get a response in the nasopharynx, but no response in the plasma, and because of the existence of those cases, that's that's what's driving, right, this non-correlation. Why I can believe it as well. Oh right, yeah, I see. I yeah, I get what you're saying there. Yeah, that, yeah. I think you're right. Um... <clears throat> okay, yeah, let's uh, <laughs> dawdle over interpreting uh, <laughs> the flow a little bit. Uh, yeah. Next we have uh, two def, and for this one, uh, they are they have matched samples, mm -hmm. right? They have. They have the sample both from the blood and from the nasopharynx, and so they try to bin them mm. <laughs> it, so they can uh, make some categories, right? So you could have uh, no response in the plasma and no response in the nasopharynx. You have the response in both the plasma and the nasopharynx, or in just one of them, plasma but not nasopharynx, nasopharynx but not plasma. So type A is when they're, they're positive in both. You've got, you got antibodies in both areas. B is just antibodies in the plasma. And C is just antibodies in the nose. So you can see there are very few that have antibodies just in their nose. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And the ones that do have antibodies just in their nose all seem to be part of the critical mm. uh, patients, right? So like that's one of the patterns that they yeah. see. And then, of course, as we expect, uh, those that have no antibodies in plasma or very low antibodies in plasma in nose, those are the healthy controls. Right. <laughs> so yeah, this is a, a system they've kind of devised for this study to classify their patients. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I guess the other thing that I noticed from this figure is that uh, there's a lot more variance in type A than there is in type B, right? Like in type B, because everything gets there's I guess because there's no, uh, I'm not sure. Maybe that's not true because there is a lot of variance in in fig, in, in panel E. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, that's. I there's more variance in the IgA levels than in the IgG levels. Right. <laughs> in the in the plasma. Okay. <clears throat> uh, that, I mean, we don't know really don't know what to make of that. Um, yeah, I don't know. So, <laughs> I know, <it's> just moving <laughs> on. <laughs> moving on. So, uh, so now <laughs> another heat, big old heat map. This time they're looking at. Um, I mean, essentially, it's the same. It is this information yeah. again, right? Just shown in a heat map form. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is the heat form of the information. And, uh, yeah, I mean, those are the two observations, too, that I could see from those previous graphs are also here. Um, yeah. Right. How can you see them here? You can see them in the amount of uh, red, uh, the amount of orange that gets concentrated. Yeah, it gets uh, yeah. around, like, around, like, there's most of the orange it seems to be in the A group, which is double positive, which, uh, again, yeah. they're usually the, the, the mild to severe. But then again, they're the biggest group. Uh, so these groups are, they're not like, this isn't a random allocation. They're they are non-random. They've got lots of different, uh, 
so yeah i mean personally yeah. i feel I, yeah i find the previous graph easier to look at because yeah. it like split it all up because when everything's mashed together like if the groups aren't the same size then like you can't go by the area of the color right because like the area of the color is not the magnitude within the group it's actually the individual bars like yeah. there's only those two lines for c and you have to just like zoom in on those two bars and then try to compare them against everything else <clears throat> Uh, yeah. Okay. Anyway, moving on. Now <laughs> we're moving on to the cytokine portion of our of our story. Um, so, <laughs> where they they do some comparisons to try and figure out which cytokines are different between groups. Yes. Yeah. So they had forty six in total that they measured, and in plasma they only get like a significant difference between healthy donors and the COVID nineteen patients in thirteen of them. And so that's just a way of com uh, collapsing their data a little, so they don't have to show us like all these uh, rows of data that like they're essentially the same between mm. the two things because like th those aren't the things those aren't the responses that we care about right we want to know what's happening in the immune response to infection and so if they're if the cytokines are the same between these two things that's not interesting right for the study yeah <laughs> and for the cytokines that are different most of that difference happens in the severe gr in the critical group um yes 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 and again i guess oh no actually in this version i can see it more clearly right because it's kind of like a linear movement so as you move towards the critical you get that increase in orange um yeah but if, if you don't believe that you can look at the graphs below <laughs> and you can see their little statistical test that they did between healthy controls and critical you can see that increase in significance but also in effect size just they don't show that with statistics yeah. but you can see it in and the thing about <laughs> like severe disease and covid i think we've talked about the term cytokine storm previously um mm -hmm. So that is a thing that might be happening here as well. So it might tell you. So in the severe cases, it could be the immune system just running amok and and mm -hmm. setting out quite a lot of cytokines that uh, do different that are not necessarily are not necessarily specifically targeted to a COVID response, but more just general because the immune system's becoming overwhelmed slightly. And hit yeah, yeah. So like 13 of 46 is the metric for healthy donors versus COVID-19. Mm. But it'd be interesting to see uh, for the whole 46 panel, what's the what's the breakdown when you split out moderate, severe, and critical against, right, against, uh, um, against healthy? Because if we're going down the path of like, oh my God, the immune system's going crazy, maybe there's more, right, like measured cytokines that hit significance when you just compare critical versus healthy. Right. Then, then moderate versus healthy. <clears throat> yeah, I think... They do not do this analysis. <laughs> yeah, um, but that would be... They could. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting question. Uh, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, moving on to the next one, where they look at the nasopharynx samples. Um, mm -hmm. uh, um, and sa same deal, I guess? Uh, same deal. That, but, yeah, but they have, their, they have fewer that actually overlap here. Um, so they only have seven of the 46 and, gain significance. <laughs> and they're pretty much all of them are different. All of them are very much more. There's only like two that. We, so in the previous, the, so if you compare the cytokines from the previous one and this one, they're almost no matches. There's only maybe two that match. The yeah, yeah. And I think to me this is nice. I, I like this evidence as saying that the immune compartments are distinct, right? Because like the stuff that's being talked about in these uh, these compartments are really quite different. But again, not not unexpected <laughs> from what we know of, of the science. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, moving on. So uh, I guess the other, way, the other thing to say here is that uh, in this case, we actually see some things where we see decreases, right? Yes. Some of the things that hit significance here, it's not that they get more of them in the nasal mucosa, it's that they get less of it. Um, and so that that's uh, that's kind of interesting, right? I think those are considered. <laughs> That's like might be like more the immunoregulatory stuff, yeah. right? The stuff that happens, inflammatory responses. Uh, yeah, those interferons. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's a really important point because a good immune response isn't just throwing everything in the wit at the wall. It's regulated. It's it's specific yeah. and distinct. So uh, it is interesting. And, from, and how we were talking about mucosa before, right? That it has to thread the needle between like uh, raising the alarm and not, it sort of makes sense that you would see, right? Like these immunomodulatory, immunosuppressive cytokines being decreased in this case, because, right? Like that's that's our hypothesis anyways of like the crazy cytokine storm that's going on. It's like removing some of those roadblocks. Yeah, I mean, what <clears throat> doesn't make sense is uh, that 
if it is a society kind of storm, it doesn't. We don't. See, you aren't seeing that much evidence of it, except maybe in one or two. One or I think it's the only one that really gets really activated in the severe cases. That you don't see it in the other, the rest yeah. of them. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, in the coastal site, right in the mucosal sites. That's where we're seeing this. Yes, I believe. Okay. Yeah, CC MCP one is the one that's getting. Uh, so CCL two and IL ten are. So CCL two was the one that I was pointing out as the one that was being really activated in the severe one, and they also focus mm. in on IL ten. Uh, again, um, uh, so IL ten is what I was. So when I was in like microbiology school, they taught me that that was the regulator, regulatory, very it calms everything down. Whereas CCL2 yep. is a macrophage like chemokine. So it, when it's there, macrophages come towards it. They're... It's attracting things, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> uh, and they find that they're increased in in more severe disease, although that, that, that not so much in the nasopharynx. Yes. <clears throat> oh, in the, in the nasopharynx. Oh, is this what we're looking here? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah uh, this is BD. Oh, BD, yeah. yeah. I got... <clears throat> uh, yeah. Yep. But they are both increased in this case. Yes. Which is, again, one of those difficult things about interpreting what's going on with the immune system because you sort of describe just two opposite yes. things, and those two opposite things are going up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's quite hard to... I mean, if you read a Wikipedia article for a science kind, you're of, you, the first line will say something, and then you read further, and the other lines will say something completely different because yes, a lot of this exactly. is very context-based. <laughs> totally. And, yeah. Okay. Uh... Blundering on, we have figure S3AB, mm -hmm. um, and so now they're they wanted to just see the cytokines that were different between the plasma from critical cases versus um, non-critical cases. And so this is actually maybe getting at a little bit what I was saying earlier, right? Like, what if they just compared every each of these subgroups to healthy controls? They uh, they simplify it more uh, just to look at the differences between the critical and the non-critical. Mm. But there are differences, right? Like, so yes, there is some extra response happening in the critical um, the critical group. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the interesting here thing here to see is a uh, inter the, the very bottom interferon alpha two which is a really, like, antiviral yeah. interferon, is downregulated in the severe yeah. cases. Which, mm -hmm. interesting behavior, not really seen that from this uh, scientist before, so it must be, this might be something going on there. Might be interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I do think that um, their data set's really nice, maybe. I, I think it contributes a lot to the literature in terms of, like, what are the hallmarks of critical disease? Like, why do people go down that path? And like, uh, I know that that's like a place that is really useful to study because it, I mean, it really impacts the way that you go down a treatment path for those patients. Um, yeah, so it's cool from that perspective. I think some useful information there. <clears throat> yeah. Um, moving on through these like infinite panels where they look at so many uh, science kinds. Um... <laughs> But this time it's the nasopharyngeal samples, and it's the same way that we saw in the previous panel, just critical versus non-critical. <laughs> and we see, like, actually quite a lot of differences. So previously when we looked at there was there weren't very many, but they've done a different correlation now. So now they're coming up with yeah. a very different sample of what size you can... So, oh, um, yeah, there you get... Yeah, no, I actually think that that's, that's, a, that's a really good thing to bring up because... Um, to me, this is how I would interpret it. It speaks to the complexity of regulating things in the nasopharynx, <laughs> right? During disease, right? Like you know, when you look against healthy things, uh, it's hard to see, like everything's kind of, there's not a lot actually. It, it seems like not a lot is happening, mm. but actually within disease, right? Like there's all these nuanced ways in which the immune system is, is trying to figure out what's going on. And that really seems to have some sort of correlation with the outcome of what's go ha happening with your disease. But remember, I think it's also important to remember we're not thinking about the very genetic backgrounds of the people that enter, mm -hmm. right? Like critical versus non. Like there's confounding factors all over the place here because uh, of how it's working. So um, this is the, the danger of like all these correlatory things because as you get deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole, you might get to things that seem really interesting to talk about, but like now, but then you have to remember, wait, but we also have to cross-reference that against, right? All the other covariates that might be influencing this scenario. Yes, <clears throat> exactly. Um, and now we're moving on to the next one where they look at VEGF and CCL2. Uh, so uh, CCL2, if I recall correctly, is uh, 
Let me see. I'm uh, the chemo attractant. That's the chemo attractant one. We were just talking yeah, that's about right. It uh, and VEGF is vascular endothelial growth factor, so that's most commonly found for for growing of new blood vessels. I, I tend to think of it as like a repair cytokine, where like a disease and your immune system have done lots of damage, so it comes in at the end of it to be like calm down. Um, but mm -hmm. but again, yeah, anti-inflammatory. But it, it, yeah, it can recruit. I think it also recruits things in that repair way, but recruits things not in a way to cause inflammation. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. uh, for for sure um and yeah they see a correlation oh. in like it's more severe the more you see of these um yep okay uh yeah so those are commonalities in in severe versus uh sorry critical versus non-critical uh, okay so figure 3f um so here we have uh, <laughs> uh cytokines uh they want to compare it against uh, the antibody levels, mm. right? So, like now, instead of ordering uh, to, uh, with the v disease severity, right? You can see the top bar. It's kind of it's not a. They didn't group the colors of the severity together. Instead, they group the colors of antibody binding together, right? And so you can see they have the IgA and IgG dot binding dot spike. Yep. <laughs> Those ones have the the contiguous bars of blue or orange. So that's what they've grouped this heat map on. Um, and then they're going to see are there any patterns that come out from the cytokines uh, that you can see. And yes, right? Like if you have an antibody response, you're probably going to have a lot of these cytokines that are upregulated. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's it, again, this is interesting because they, they're basically taking the same data and then just like pushing it in different directions to try and figure out what correlations they can get out of it. Um, yes, yes. Yeah, the paper falls into this category of like fishing for like uh, fishing for meaning. Right, like they've brought together uh, what they, from from sort of a priori knowledge, you would think is a meaningful set of data, right? And then they're trying to extract, right, like what they think is like, oh, this is really interesting here that we're seeing. But to do that, they have to look at it from all these different angles. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so now we're going to figure for A B, uh, viral load increase in plasma, uh, and nasopharynx. Um, yeah, so they're adding viral load into the yes. mix, right? Saying so now, if we measure using, I think they use RT-PCR. Um, like, how does this correlate? Right? Or well, not correlation at first. First, it's just uh, how much is it uh, laid upon disease, and as you would expect, greater disease, greater viral loads. Um, yeah, but I mean the weird, then, yeah, sorry, the weird oh, thing yeah, is sorry. the nasopharyngeal viral, viral seems to be kind of independent of clinical presentation, so it doesn't seem to increase or decrease as much. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, I mean. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. With the with the severity. <clears throat> so it's almost like everything else is going crazy, but in the nas in the mucosa, it's every business is new usual. Like no one's noticed anything, and it's still <laughs> pottering along, which is, yeah. uh, kind of, kind of odd. Um, but I, I actually, again, to me, this this isn't odd. This is like exactly what you would think because. Like, it, this is the whole thing, that your mucosa is not supposed to go crazy. Mm. <laughs> and so, like, it is not it is not controlling the viral load in the same way. It, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that makes sense, because otherwise it would, like, your immune system would... When it goes crazy in the mucosa, it goes really crazy, and it gets it can be quite damaging. It might, so, like, what's happening... Right, to me, it's the moderate group is not being controlled in the mucosa, right? That's the, that's the potentially surprising object, right? Yeah. You would think there should be more control there because it is because these people are moderate and <laughs> lie in that area. But um, but actually because the mucosa isn't trying to control st things always, right? Like it's just it's leaving it alone because that's what it does. And I mean, you know, again, very hard to see like what the intention of anything is or like what the <laughs> the, the the directionality of any of these things are, mm. but. But I'll say it, it it fits really nicely with the idea of spreading the virus, mm. right? Because like, of course, like this is maybe why respiratory viruses exist in the first place. Because the nose is a place that isn't well controlled, so you can just like you can hang out there, you can grow, you can spread, right? Um, and then maybe you can even go into further into the body and get more disease. Uh, the mucosa doesn't mind. <laughs> Deeper in your body minds. <laughs> oh. Anyway, next uh, infection. We've got some. More advanced data analysis. 
Yeah, so they're gonna, so they have their cytokines, they have their antibody responses, they just threw in the viral response. Uh, they want to group these variables in some way and, and show clusters. And so they do it in two ways. They do this MDS, uh, multi-dimensional scaling uh, correlation matrix, which is actually really similar to um, like things that we've talked about before that have done clustering on complex data sets. Right, so like a PCA, PCOA, uh, UMAP, right? These are similar ways of like taking, right? You imagine their data set, it's like a really long table. Mm. <laughs> all these patients, right? All these different amounts, they've organized their table strangely. I find this very bizarre. They organize it by, but, but this is not, I find it bizarre, but then I read other papers, this happens all the mm. time. You organize it by uh, the things you're measuring. So they organize it by, uh, uh, viral load, cytokines, and antibody response characteristics. And then they say, are there any commonalities between each of these rows that we've ordered the, the, the table by, right? So the columns in this table are all the patients. They all get averaged mm. out, basically, right? So every point is uh, is all the patients. Right. <laughs> the, the, the sum mm. of, I mean, it's very complicated. It's a multidimensional thing. It's the response of all the patients on this one axis, VEGF, or viral load. And if those responses are similar, so I guess what we're thinking is like going up, going down, right? Like whatever it is, like rising and falling, um, they'll they'll cluster together. Uh, but you know, the clusters are what you make of them. Right. <laughs> um, I fully appreciate that when I was reading this paper, because I assumed that this was going, but you're right. They are all hedging all their patients into one like block, which as yeah. we've seen previously, that's actually quite taking a lot of diversity and pushing it down into one thing. So I can mm -hmm. see that they might mm -hmm. lose a lot of detail when they're doing this analysis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's nice because they have, I think they do it because they have so many different axes in which to examine these patients. Right. Um, but yeah, it would be interesting to see like on the other side, like what if they did it, what if they use the patients as the rows and then they colored things by the by the different responses that might be kind of interesting but again it's still it still has its own limitation yeah. right like we, yeah, we so... would still complain i think even if that i feel like yeah, i'd go we... cross-eyed if they showed a table like that but i think this is a good way of them passing out the data and trying to look for a commonality and pick out just because just so we don't have to deal with so many different things they can pick up things with the biggest effects and yeah, yeah. So that's MDS, but then the correlation matrix is like another, yet another way of doing it, mm. right? Which again, they still crush everything down into a single, all the patients into a single row, um, but then they, but then they just lay it out with like a heat map, right? <laughs> right? Like so, right. each one uh, is compared with each other uh, thing, and then you get heat maps. So you can kind of see some like blue clusters where things. Well, actually, the blue clusters are not good because if they, if the blue clusters exist on the uh, y equals x axis, then essentially it's just like similar things cluster together. Yes. <laughs> right. Uh, so like all the IgGs all cluster together, <laughs> all the total IgAs all cluster together. Of course they do. We saw that earlier, right? <laughs> Where the bar, the bar was the same across all of them. Um, yeah. yeah. I guess the interesting place is maybe like things like you can see random dark patches that pop up, like TNF alpha correlates really strongly with IL-10. Uh, you know, to me, that those are the interesting things that pop up with this analysis. I mean, the interesting uh, things for me are the things that don't correlate. The white spots, the red spots, those are the things I'm tending to focus on. Looking at the negative space mm -hmm. can be quite interesting. Sure. That's a really good way of doing it, too. Yeah, CCL3 doesn't correlate with a whole bunch of the different cytokines, right? Yeah. It's anti, doing its own thing. <laughs> yeah. Not affected. Actually, it, you know, this is a... We've said it a lot. We've said it with large data set papers, right? Like once you get the data set, now there's so many ways you can talk about it and inform other things. Um, but it's kind of hard to draw those conclusions from this alone. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> okay. I, I think I'm good with that. It's, uh, yeah. Um, look at, uh, 4D. Yeah. Where at basically the same thing that we were doing, trying to do it just visually there, they've uh, highlighted the things for us that they think we should be looking at. Um, they pulled it out, they pulled out those patients, they expanded that row, right, and they threw it on a correlation plot uh, to show us. <clears throat> yeah, viral load is positively associated with a systemic immune, um, sorry, systemic inflammatory response. So, mm -hmm. uh, again, this is sort of saying stuff that we've kind of thought about earlier. Um, yeah, I mean, 
didn't notice the IFN Alpha 2 from an earlier graph. Yeah. <laughs> Right. So it's like, you know, it's uh, reinforcing right? Well, the sort of stuff that I mean, it, it better be the same because you're the same patient. So if it wasn't like that, then I'd be up in arms. But <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. And I guess maybe the new information here is because they are correlating this against viral load. It's nice to see that. Right. Like we know that viral load correlates, but we already knew that viral lo load correlated with the severity of it. So like if we were seeing before things correlate with severity, then of course this would correlate as well. Right. This is like the whole thing of the paper. Right. If, if there's a lot of logic at play. Mm -hmm. Right. Like if you accept the basic premise of logic, right, that the paper says, then everything else is like, yes, that all flows from the basic premise of logic. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, which I mean, we we can't take that for granted because I've been, done a PhD. I know that re experiments often don't follow logic sometimes, and that's so. Mm -hmm. uh, again, like these, these sorts of fishing experiments, you don't necessarily go in trying to hope that you see something that you expect. So you go in hoping that you see something completely whacked out and insane, because then you can write a big yeah. paper about it. Yes. 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 <clears throat> uh, so, and, 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 and I just want to say, and in the case where you don't see anything crazy, it's not necessary. it's not bad, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, like, they should be publishing that stuff. It's understanding that we weren't sure about before, we only hypothesized before, and now we're confirming. Yeah. Um, but, uh, because these confirmations are sort of at this correlation stage, I would say that they haven't dug deep enough to really give me that strong, like, yes, like, I, I do know this stuff for sure, right? And so, yeah, that's that's one of the things... Uh, to keep in mind when interpreting data from these types of papers. <laughs> so, yeah, now we're moving to the nasopharynx, where we're trying to look at the, the same kinds of patterns, and we're finding things are working out very differently. The di different things are clustering together in ways that we didn't, wouldn't usually expect. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, different than the systemic response, which, again, we knew they were already pushing us down this particular uh, hypothesis. So yeah, let's let's move on because I don't want to. Yeah, to we don't want to. We don't need to. Let's just. Go to, yep, the basic. We're moving. Go to their highlights. Yeah. That, <laughs> that, uh, but yeah, I think I'm gonna go skip straight to Figure Five A B C because I think that's where th this paper does get very interesting for me, and I I quite like this because this is something yeah, that let's do it. yeah this is something that I haven't seen done in any other SARS-CoV-2 paper where they look at the bacteria. Yeah. The, the actual commensal <laughs> microbiome, because we talk a lot about the good bacteria that live inside of us, but we don't, no one's actually looked at, well, it's, I haven't pe found any papers that look at the changes to the microbiome from like the, the healthy to the really severe uh, COVID <laughs> patients. And I find this quite interesting because they, so they've got this big bar chart that shows like, well, firstly, we're now familiar with the healthy, like severe, non-severe, uh, and then like the severe and then the critical. And we see yeah. that the the microbiome does go through some uh, big changes. Uh, yeah, yeah, like the color bars are all like these genera of bacteria, right? They got yeah. grouped by that CNS method, and you see that the color bars, you get a lot more of that blue, it seems, right, as you go up in severity. That correlates with Staphylococcus. Yes. You get a lot less of the orange, is what I would say. That correlates with Carinibacterium. Yeah. O overall, the diversity goes down a lot, and um, I, I don't know, have you ever, because I remember when I was like doing my PhD, I was doing experiments with streptococcal infection, and I, and I found like a same thing happening where, where like the diversity of micro microbes in the, that area would decrease when you had a big, really severe infection. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that that is, I think that that's well established information these days, <laughs> like, uh, right, like because inflammatory responses is. Uh, is a type of selection, yes. right? So essentially, like, you're selecting now the community and only some things will pass that bar of selection. Right. So you said uh, you said diversity, right? That's in, that's in figure B, right? They have these, like, metrics. So, like, you can see, like, by color, but, like, uh, is sort of, like, the crushing of diversity. But they also have, like, numbers that they can assign to diversity, yeah. and that's what they're doing in B. And then in C, that's also a way of doing diversity. That's like they do like lists of like everything that exists in one thing and everything that exists in the common area or like the commonalities between them and then the unique list. And then that becomes PCOA. It, you know, that's a big table if you imagine it. Yeah. And you can see things split out as well. So, yeah, you can see like the red <laughs> red dots are like very kind of monocultured uh, severe cases. And then the the healthy and the less severe they kind of cluster together and so they're all kind of putting together the same information the same message that uh, when you have SARS-CoV-2 the diversity of of commensal bacteria disappears they 
Um, Absolutely. <laughs> which uh, makes makes sense because again, like you said, they're by there's these commensal bacteria. They're bystanders in this uh, whole mm-hmm. inflammatory outbreak, and so you're getting yeah. this system where all these macrophages, all these like immune cells are piling in, and any bacteria that doesn't have like a solution to deal with them is going to get uh, destroyed. Which is why yeah. staph, which often we see like the, it's a commensal bacteria, and certain ones do have ways of dealing with the immune system to stop it from, mm-hmm. and that's what mm-hmm. eventually leads to diseases. And I feel like this is almost like p- picking up on like how secondary inf- infections can flourish because a lot of that isn't just because you've got because we have like potentially infectious bacteria living with us, and then that balance some some balance of the body can change, and the immune mm-hmm. and suddenly they're selected for and they can become invasive. So you get secondary infections occurring. Yeah. I mean, this is the mystery that I would love to see. Like, I actually, I think of this, I'm not sure. I haven't done a literature search recently on, like, topics that were close to my thesis, like, things that I was thinking about. But one of the things I always wanted to see was, how can you take data sets like this, right, where we see staphylococcal, the, gen- the genus is expanding. Mm. We know the genus just through um, through the 16S sequence. Right. But is there enough information in the variants of that 16S sequence to then also say something about, like, the staphylococcal strains that are present, right? Like, I don't know how much data, uh, like, because, like, <laughs> it could only be that it's a simple match, right? Like, I think it might be, but sometimes the 16S variance is a little bit bigger. Right? It could be like three or four things. Is that enough information to encode right difference in strain? Um, and if it isn't, right, then how can you do a follow-up uh, PCR on that same sample, right? Uh, amplify something different from it, and then build that diversity graph, right? Because yeah. maybe in there we would find really interesting associations um, to to virulence factors or something like that. I mean, that's <laughs> going to be quite interesting because bacterial genetics, because bacteria they share their genetics all over the place so different genes can have different lineages to bacteria so that's where things get very confusing but well it gets quite hard to pin down because you you, finding the thing to correlate to those virulence factors right is going to be yeah is like really difficult yeah so maybe just directly measuring them right maybe just directly measuring those strain specific things that we have a hypothesis on in the sample could be the way to do it or if you could spend like the length of maybe like two phds to, to find a single cell sourcing strategy to do like that like we did so with the hamsters where picking out bacteria but that's a lot to do and yes, they definitely yes, did not yes. have the resources to do that and i'm not sure they had the oh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> not at all I definitely yeah. don't mean to imply that they should be doing no. that but it was just like seeing the data and like seeing staff i'm like oh yeah like this would be so great if like this this could be done and this is why this kind of research is kind of interesting because that's it's very much ideas generating you they go out and see mm-hmm. something that you that you can't quite explain or you can find and then people other people can come on and go all right i can do a slam dunk experiment to figure out how to actually <laughs> test these out um totally totally uh so we're moving on like maybe you question the way that they showed us these differences in um the community composition so they do this protonova test and then they make sure that it's not confounded by sex or by uh smoking status yeah uh, again, things that anybody would like pick up is like, okay, because like there's going to be natural differences in microbiome community and certain different people with based on lifestyle or well mostly lifestyle choices and things like that. So uh, this is to mm-hmm. like pull those out to see could these explain the difference? Uh, and since yeah. they don't, we can move on quite quickly from this. For sure. Yeah. Um, uh, and they also try to validate with other clustering techniques, mm. <laughs> right? So, oh, well, maybe it's the because you use Permanova and Bray Curtis to similarity, but what if you used NMDS or PLSDA, right? These other algorithmic techniques. Um, but again, they still see the critical samples cluster away. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is a, gr- a very if you're learning how to do analyses, this is a paper that will like show you lots and lots of different ways to do things and interpret them. Yeah, I think I like what they did with their analyses here because, I mean, yeah, it's like not super stimulating to read a bunch of them, but it shows you like they really took the time to like try to address maybe some different concerns that could come out where people are trying to attack the analysis itself. I mean, um, I mean, you could say that, but if you're being cynical like me, I'd say, oh, but they're this really interested in their fishing expedition. They're trying to pull in every single tool to try and cast a wide <laughs> net. But... <laughs> True say. <laughs> but that's... Okay, let's... Uh, next one. Um, F, F, 
Um, this is just another little quick control, right, to say that, uh, well, changes in community composition, that could just be because there's less microbiome, right, like in these different cases. Right. That's not really what they see here by doing this uh, RT-PCR basically on 16 sr RNA. Also, I don't think this is very good. This is a strange, this is this control actually, I know that there's a lot of underlying assumptions that actually aren't so good about it, but we'll, we'll give it to them. <clears throat> yeah, we, we'll let them have that. Um... We can talk more after when we finish going through all the figures. Yeah, I don't, I don't uh, yeah, like get too into the weeds there. We, we will see microbiome studies again, right? Like that that much is true, yes. right? And and we'll try to get into some of the limitations of the way in which that you look at it. Uh, but yeah, let's 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 get to more of their correlations. Yeah. So looking at statistically dif different genera in healthy samples versus uh in versus non healthy samples. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and they pick out uh, these two, these three different things. One, Staphylococcus, which we saw before, right? Uh, the one crinibacterium, bacterium, we also saw that before by color. Mm. Um, and then we also have the Dolos uh, granulum, which I actually have never heard about as a generic. Yeah, no, I, like, when I was doing my, like, kind of drawing the kind of big, like, the, the, the title picture, I was trying to Google pictures of that, and it took me a long time, because it's, it's very, it's not a, a common thing to people talk about it's not yeah. well, welcome to the world of microbiome everybody yeah. where the things that we've studied for ages because it was easy to grow them and now we've realized there's other important bacteria but we've never tried to grow them before yeah <laughs> i mean dolos are grand the one thing i did learn in my literature is it is, takes a long long time to grow it is very hard to grow up so that's <laughs> that's why what people didn't talk about it before because it was just yeah. too hard um <laughs> Right. Exactly. Um, so yeah, those are things we saw. And actually, if you go back to the old heat map, I'm not asking us to do it, but like you could probably pick out the color shift as well. So again, just another way of showing some of the data that we've seen before. Um, but if you restrain your search to just looking at uh, severe, right, s s critical against non-critical, uh, you actually get like a bunch more significant things to pop out. Um, and this is kind of interesting because this is hard to pick out from the color graph where all these bars are really tiny, right? But now they actually do find some things, Prevotella, Clostridia, uh, Streptococcus, right, that are being pulled out as being more significantly um, abundant, more abundant in the in the critical versus the non-critical cases. <clears throat> oh, yeah, de definitely. Uh, and they did like kind of do a big correlation to try and correlate the beneficial genera and those genera that are associated with critical diseases. Um, and they did find like a negative correlation, I guess, uh, by the looks of it. Um, yeah, are we looking at S5G? S5G, sorry, yeah, a weak negative correlation, but it's, so there could be yeah, something there. Yeah. Yeah, it could be something there. Again, like we already saw the like how it goes up and goes down. Like this is this correlation exists in the logic of how they've already shown us the information. Right. Um. So it's like a double check, and it's the same data as well. Yeah. It's just to make sure that what you saw in the last thing, your eyes aren't lying to you. The numbers like back it up. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so in figure 6AB, they're going to trot out MDS again, and now they're going to throw in more, they're going to throw in all of their um, their microbial diversity measures mm. into this into this mix. Um, and uh, yeah, they get clustering again. I actually think in this one, it's even more confusing into what the real clusters are, because... Um, because there's more dots, it's just like a busier space. Like, who's to say like what dots fit in which areas? Um, yeah. But they've highlighted the things on the left hand side in B, right? The sort of things they want to point out, right? And that is that uh, there's a decrease of uh, uh, there's a decrease of certain cytokines. Um, with the SARS-CoV-2 infection, uh, and then that associates with this positive, uh, beneficial microbe. Yeah, and <laughs> I, I know we've been piping on this a bit, but like always, like correlation and causation. It's like in the back of your mind, you have to kind of always have that. It's not necessarily ca causation. This because they're, they're both kind of markers of the severe disease, uh, effectively. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yes, that's right. Like there is, we already know the confounder that's sitting there. It's like, yeah, it's the severe disease. <clears throat> uh, okay, another way to see it, if you want to look at the the like a, a correlation matrix instead, right? The dark spots and the light spots, they show it us here as well. You could go in and find your favorite, you know, 
uh, peculiarity and and ask follow up questions. <clears throat> yeah, and then they got another big MDS to look at the relations between viral, nasal viral load cytokines and antibody mm -hmm. char characteristics. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, this is um, again they they find very similar things. Um, uh, yeah, uh, so I'm um, in these this case I guess it, since the nose it's a bit more relevant. I because I think previously looking at the systemic cytokines and looking at the correlations, whereas in the nose you see much more firm clustering. But... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because this probably has a more direct, right? Like they, they are more directly correlated. Right? Um, and I think that probably comes up. Does it come up on the MDS as well? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, it comes up on. It, the... Yeah, no, I don't know. It's hard to say. Like, if this looks more clustery than the other ones, I mean, there. I think there's a that actually just tells us the value of MDS. Right, is that like it actually can sometimes show a stronger clustering effects, right, than this correlation matrix mm. can. Uh, but I mean, once again, it's kind of like you choose your own way of interpreting it, right? And like these are all ways to just help us understand this rather complex data set that they've brought together. Um, but at the end of the day, that's all they are, right? <laughs> and so what this paper sort of screams out for is follow-up studies. Right. It's sort of saying, look at this really cool system. Right. Like what what could we make of this stuff? Because I do believe a lot of that what they found was kind of it, OK. They, they did describe it well, that uh, change in the immune response right in the nasal uh, environments. Right. Uh, causes changes in the microbiota. Right. That is something that you could hypothesize about and that people would say that seems right. But then they showed uh, some data to support that. <clears throat> yeah, so um, so I think that if we're going to summarize this paper, they did some good work like establishing that SARS-CoV-2 immunity is different in different areas and that there are some changes to the bacterial community, but again, they're, they're often comparing quite different samples, uh, so I think we've mentioned like ser the secretions and blood samples are quite different, so there might be some, so when making those comparisons, you might need to take into account that if you're comparing, comparing one sample with another sample with more variation, trying to keep that in your mind when you're trying to figure out like how and also like mm -hmm. um you have to, this is these this is just a snapshot of the immune response we don't know what happened the day after or the day before yeah and I and and we don't know too much about like uh like directionality of the <laughs> the effects right like we sort of assume right it's definitely we think it's like it's definitely the infection right because that's like our biggest healthy versus not healthy mm. uh groups that we can we can compare but like in terms of like cytokine the cytokines play off the nasal microbiome like that actually that's a huge area of research right people think that the microbiome helps influence our cytokine profile that gives us protective or not not protective responses right and like in this case like we are we're saying because it's such a strong um, experimental intervention to say we, we have infected people, right? But actually, there's also probably interplay between, right? Like when something grows in the microbiome, it also changes the cytokine, which then may influence the course of the infection. And all of that is, that's all happened, right? That's all the part of the, I, this is part of the snapshot, I think, idea, yeah. right? Is that like, we actually have no idea like at which time any of these things occurred. This is just the state of it as they've seen it. <clears throat> yeah, this is, uh, this is a complete observation study by that I mean there isn't any intervention properly that they use that all mm -hmm. even hypothesis testing it's very much of we go and look and which means that throughout this when you're reading you have to like have that correlation is not necessarily causation and when and you can try and infer a direction of causality but it's very difficult because for most papers mm -hmm. that have a slam dunk they go in and so they try to prove causation by interfering with what they think is causing it and then seeing where that affects yeah. the effect uh, they haven't been able yeah. to do that so this is very much yeah. the first step where you're looking at the effect and making an educated guess at the causes. But um, this is a very important part of science, but it doesn't get much love because, again, you don't get the glamour glamorous home run of a proof. You just have, like, the bedrock. Mm -hmm. And then p other people go and read this and generate a hypothesis and go, okay, well, we know this delosa granulum uh, is associated with a healthy microbiome. What happens if we give that to... Uh, SARS-CoV-2 in fact, does that help with the microbiome be good or does it just get annihilated by an overactive immune system? We don't know, but... Yeah, 
Yeah, perfect. No, I, I, I really, I think that's a really great summary of, of what we've seen today. And, uh, and I'll, I'll add in like my plug always for, for budding young scientists, right? That like, this also highlights the importance, right? Of when, pu when publishing things that you publish your data openly, because then, and that you have the tools in your disposal, even if you just understand how to ask someone how to use these tools, right? Like to analyze it for yourself, because there could be something that's really relevant to what you're studying in this mix, and you'd like to extract that, right? And, and then maybe re, re find it, refigure it out at the bench, right? And then go on your own tangents. Uh, and I think that that's uh, th this is part of like the increasingly collaborative nature of science, right? And uh, an important fluency, right? Uh, the, to develop as you're reading papers <clears throat> yeah uh so i think that's i think we've covered everything i want want to cover with this paper um totally yeah me too um join us next week for our news week uh where we're going to survey papers to find something to cover in detail the following week and uh, just to let people know uh, we're thinking about maybe not putting so much focus on SARS-CoV-2 um we'll still try to show people like the most important papers that we think uh, are coming out in that topic but uh we've scratched a lot of the introductory topics i think uh in this area yeah, I mean, well, uh, I think uh, next week in the UK, they're going to basically have a lockdown anniversary festival, I think. It's where they're kind of, or memorial, <laughs> not festival, a memorial, because uh, things have been pretty bad. And I, I think I want to take this opportunity to go through the papers that we might have missed because of our focus on SARS-CoV-2. So, nice. yeah. Yeah, so on Ozithera, I've been compiling a list of the most cited papers in 2020 that had nothing to do with SARS-CoV-2. And I'm going to be going through that next week. So we can look at... Uh, what we might have missed because of our focus on SARS-CoV-2. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so join us next week. And we want to remind everyone that while we're very enthusiastic about microbiology and somewhat qualified, it is possible we didn't get everything right. So science is about thinking critically and asking the right questions. So if you have any questions or corrections, please let us know in the comments. I totally agree. You can reach out to us over Twitter with that hashtag that we mentioned before, MicroTWJC. And we both believe that peer review is a process. This is it. <laughs> so we hope that people can participate with us and that you had a good time listening to us ramble about microbiology today. Yeah, it's been a pleasure chatting with you, Danny. Same here, Fuzz. <laughs> uh, tune in next week for more microbiology content.